Take a close look at these two tennis rackets. Despite sharing striking similarities in their wooden composition and overall design scheme, these professional level rackets were produced upwards of 80 years apart, with the latter Dunlop Max Ply famously used by John McEnroe to win the 1981 edition of Wimbledon. Though the tried and tested wooden racket had been extensively re-engineered and refined over that time span with such additions as laminated wood and leather grips which made for a lighter, stronger, and more comfortable product, the prevailing vision of what the best possible tennis racket setup could look like remained sterile and wholly unimaginative for upwards of a century. However, that's not to say in all that time that manufacturers didn't at least experiment with different ideas, such as Bunny Austin's Streamline model designed to drive the ball better or early metal rackets, some of which tested diagonal string patterns, with strings themselves made of metal, and even on occasion, prototypes that implemented double-strung patterns. In fact, it's ironic that racket and string design remained repetitively stale for so long considering that up until very recently, there were no rules explicitly dictating what constituted a legal tennis racket. This would all change in 1977, when a strange new string pattern implementation designed by one man would turn the tennis world on its head, which upon installation into any player's racket imparted unprecedented and unpredictable spin and bounce on every shot, allowing amateurs and virtual nobodies to beat top-ranked players at the world's biggest tournaments. As word spread of this racket system's supposed magical capabilities backed by real results, behind the scenes were those determined to stamp the racket out before it truly took off, a controversy whose ramifications potentially changed the entire future landscape of tennis. Now, unlike racket technology, the sport of tennis itself conversely was in a very experimental phase leading up to the late 1970s, no doubt in part due to the sport's booming growth in North America, where by 1974 it was reported that 33.9 million Americans had hit the courts, a dramatic increase from that of just four years prior. There were multiple men's, women, and team professional tours all in competition with each other vying to become the preeminent entity. Many tournaments were dabbling with a carpet tennis surface, and tennis balls had suddenly changed color from white to yellow. Even the players themselves had seemingly evolved overnight, with many now adopting bold fashion choices while wielding radical two-handed backhands that yielded nominal but increasing topspin. Everything was changing, except rackets. However, that didn't stop one man in Germany from tinkering with his own. You see, this is Werner Fischer. No, it's not a name you should recognize. After all, he wasn't a tennis professional, but rather a horticulturist by trade. He was, though, a player on his town's struggling club tennis team, and rather than attempt to improve his lousy game, he instead became fixated on the prospect of improving his lousy equipment. Also a table tennis player, Fisher was used to the tremendous cut and spin one could derive from a foam-covered paddle, and wanted the same effects in tennis without the requirement of manufacturing an entirely custom racket. And after years of trial and error, he figured out an ingenious way to do so using nothing more than some bits and bobs one might find in a sewing kit. Here's how it worked. In a normal tennis racket, the main and cross strings are typically interwoven throughout to provide for the most even and predictable ball trajectory. Though the strings do flex and retract as a tennis ball is hit, the orientation of the individual strings themselves shift very little during contact. Studying this, Fisher realized that if the main strings were free to shift sideways as the ball made contact, tremendous spin could be derived by the strings snapping back into place as the ball left the racket. To achieve this effect, Fisher designed a custom stringing system. Instead of the 16 to 20 crosses typically found on a racket, now only five cross strings would be utilized. Next, there would now be two sets of main strings, one set in front of and one set behind each cross string. Most importantly, the crosses would not be woven through these mains, but rather simply lie between them. The main strings would be tied together at five locations on the racket using a thin string material looped around each main string. Due to them now being tied together, if one main string was pushed sideways, they'd all move sideways. As a final touch, plastic tubing was placed at each area that strings intersected to prevent the intense friction created from prematurely wearing out the strings. And additionally, droplets of glue were applied throughout to better allow the strings to connect with the ball. When all said and done, the ensuing Frankenstein-esque racket was truly unlike anything experienced up to that point, as the dramatic string shifting and snapback that occurred with every shot produced a topspin so extreme that balls would many times bounce over the fence after hitting the ground. Satisfied with the results, Fisher partnered with a manufacturer to provide racket frames that were shown to best complement his stringing system, and after four years in development, Fisher decided to bring his invention to market and revolutionize the tennis world. The only problem was, no one was interested. With samples in tow, Fisher for a time widely showcased and demonstrated his still unnamed racket system to the German tennis establishment, mainly prospective players and coaches for consideration. But to his dismay, 
was at best met with indifference, at worst, plain ridicule. One teaching pro dismissed it as ugly and primitive, saying that because the major racket manufacturers had already tried everything, he might as well abandon his idea. Undeterred, Fisher provided samples of his specialty strung rackets to his aforementioned struggling club team, who in inexplicably short order, rose to become German state team champions. Still using Fisher's invention, teammate Erwin Muller, arguably the team's most talented and the racket's biggest proponent, then went on to make a deep run at the German national championships, beating world-class players who themselves had wins over the likes of Bjorn Borg and John Newcomb. Having now withstood real-world play testing, the upper edge provided by what the press had now dubbed the Spaghetti Racket was now not only undeniable, the racket, simply, was a cheat code. Generating unheard of shot-making capabilities, most opponents struggled to return any of the erratically bouncing balls that many times kicked up over their heads, made worse by the fact that because the spaghetti produced very little sound upon contact, players on the receiving end now lacked not only the normal visual cues, but also audio cues. Now, that's not to say the spaghetti didn't have any drawbacks. Its unpredictable output made accurate serving and volleying far more difficult. But as evidenced by the system's considerable impact within the German club network and Muller's personal success, surely there was some type of market for Fischer's spaghetti racket, right? Well, in Fischer's own words, Unfortunately, Muller, like me, was a working-class kid in an upper-crust game. He has a hick accent, he drinks beers between games, and he doesn't behave in the classic manner. He turned off the rest of the pros. And so, judged once again by the radical nature of the product and its users rather than by its capabilities, the spaghetti racket remained for a while just a niche concept that failed to connect with the broader tennis market. Wilson, we're not number one for nothing. That was until mid-1977, when it just so happened to cross paths with this man, Michael Fishbach. A virtually unheard of American professional ranked 200 in the world who by most estimates had little hope of future success. As the legend goes according to Fishbach, by pure chance he came across a model of Fisher's racket whilst browsing an obscure European camera shop and was instantly intrigued. However, the shop owner refused to part with his spaghetti model, so Fisher instead thoroughly studied and eventually recreated the racket himself upon his arrival back home in New York, a process he claimed took upwards of 30 hours to complete. And just in time, too, because despite his low ranking and possessing only three lifetime tour-level match wins, Fishbach had been granted entry into the qualifying draw of that year's US Open. Paired with his secret weapon, the 200th ranked Fishbach defied the odds against him, cruising into the main draw's second round after easily clearing three qualifying matches and a first round victory over 71st ranked and recent Wimbledon quarterfinalist Billy Martin. However, it would appear that Fishbach's good fortune would be short lived, as the true test arrived in the form of a second round matchup with the legendary two time Grand Slam champion and foregone favorite Stan Smith. What happened next was frankly shocking. Within just over an hour of play, Fishbach was already up 6-love, 5-love, utilizing unheard of topspin and unpredictable ground strokes to wipe out Smith, garnering not just the win but sensational international headlines that called out not only the effectiveness of Fishbach's bizarre looking rackets, but their potential illegitimacy and illegality, to which Fishbach responded, Of course it's legal. I could play with a shoe, or a tree, or a bottle of apple juice and it would be legal. And as mentioned earlier, he wasn't wrong. Nowhere in the ITF rulebook, tennis's governing body, did it explicitly describe what exactly a legal tennis racket was, only merely defining one as an instrument employed to strike the ball. To the continued dismay of tennis purists, in fact, the press covering Mike Fishbach's sensational run served to be the best advertisement possible for Werner Fischer's spaghetti system, as within two weeks of the US Open, nearly 25% of players participating in a follow-up tournament in France were using spaghetti-like double-strung rackets. In fact, top-ranked Ily Nastassi suffered a first-round shock defeat at the hands of little-known French player George Govin, who as you can guess, wielded a spaghetti racket, with a livid Nastassi formally vowing in a post-match interview to never again play a match against someone who used such equipment. Well, promises must not mean much in Romania, because headlining the much-anticipated Aix-en-Provence tournament final just one week later was number 2 ranked Guillermo Vilas, sporting a record 46-match winning streak, and Ily Nastassi, sporting a spaghetti-strung racket, hand-delivered and strung by Werner Fischer himself, which imparted such wicked spin and unpredictability on the ball that a disgusted Guillermo Vilas forfeited the match midway through, publicly pleading for the powers that be to permanently ban such a racket once and for all. However, despite the loss, Vilas needn't have worried, as that match would be the last time any professional would be seen playing with the spaghetti system ever again.
See, as it turns out behind the scenes, in response to the mounting complaints and overall confusion, the ITF for months had been staging demonstrations and carrying out surprisingly in-depth testing on all variants of Fisher Spaghetti Rackets to determine whether or not they in fact violated any existing rules. A kangaroo trial of sorts that many have since theorized was destined to doom the racket from the very beginning. Why? Well, as mentioned earlier, while racket tech had in fact been stagnant for years leading up to that point, the Spaghetti wasn't the only new player on the scene. Prince had just recently developed and brought to market their oversized racket models, which boasted lighter aluminum frames that were easier to swing coupled with larger overall sweet spots. A retrospectively revolutionary leap in racket technology that undoubtedly influenced a large shift for overall tennis gameplay. Despite rave customer reviews, the ITF found itself on the receiving end of scathing criticism during this time period for failing to investigate and or regulate new equipment that had the potential to change the sport, and as such, were far more wary and aggressive when the spaghetti system hit the courts not long after. Said by former USTA president Stan Malice when looking back at the matter, we wanted to stop any gimmicks that would make tennis a funny game. However, as one could imagine, that might not have been the strongest excuse to justify an outright ban. So instead, the ITF enacted a temporary freeze on use of the double-strung rackets in tournaments effective October 2nd, the day after the controversial Vilas Nastasi match. Their reasoning? It was surmised that due to their double-strung nature, a tennis ball hitting the front set of mains would cause those strings to hit the back set of mains, resulting in a double hit, which officially was an illegal shot. Whether or not this rationale was accurate or even made sense was inconsequential, as in July of the following year, the double-strung spaghetti system was officially made illegal in all areas of the sport by order of the ITF, arguing that its presence within tennis had substantially changed the nature of the game due to its unusual amount of spin imparted. And furthermore, new rules finally addressed the tennis racket definition loophole, specifically prohibiting stringing patterns that weren't in the woven and uniform pattern that one sees in all modern rackets today. Unfortunately for Werner Fischer, the impromptu initial ban was enacted right as he had finished building up his business as a full-time operation, with distributors on standby and 2,000 rackets already purchased for conversion. With no other option, Fischer was bankrupted and forced to abandon his idea, returning to his work as a horticulturist. To this day, the spaghetti racket and all similar systems remain outright banned competitively at all levels, with the exceedingly rare Fischer Strong models still in existence adorning the walls of museums and private collections though improvements in synthetic string technology and racket engineering eventually allowed players to produce even greater levels of topspin than originally seen with the spaghetti racket, one has to wonder how the game of tennis might have evolved in a reality where Fischer's system hadn't been banned. As said at the time by tennis legend Arthur Ashe, you can't volley very effectively with the racket, so you and your opponent stay at the baseline. Given the huge crowds that tennis now attracts, I think it would produce a dull, boring game. It would turn off the audience to see endless rallies, and no one going in. An ironic postulation given how the sport is played today, we can only guess what modern tennis would look like if Bjorn Borg had the opportunity to hit shots like Rafael Nadal in 1980. But now, let's be real with ourselves for a second. No player from Bill Tilden to Carlos Alcaraz achieved chart-topping success due to their use of any special racket or secret gimmick. Their dominance was of course preceded by years of hard work and outright persistence. But that only begs the question. Considering that most pros do in fact share similar upbringings and follow remarkably similar training regimens, what exactly is it? What's the slight edge that has been shown to separate the number 1 ranked player from the number 100 ranked player? How is it that singles players like Djokovic always seem to be in position to hit the perfect shot at the perfect moment? It's not luck, it's strategy. So today, I'm excited to tell you about the new rules of singles by my longtime friends at Fuzzy Yellow Balls, the sponsor of today's video. Because if you're a singles player that's unhappy with your strategy, specifically your shot selection, where a lot of times you feel like you're simply hitting the wrong shots at the wrong time, then this is specifically for you. You can check out the new rules of singles by downloading the Fuzzy Yellow Balls app today, link in the description. And within, tennis analytics expert Craig O'Shaughnessy, who has extensively worked with Novak Djokovic and other top pros, shows you the 20 new rules, new strategies tested and shown to produce the highest winning percentage. Plug these strategies into your game, and you'll immediately start hitting the right shots and win more matches. The new rules of singles also comes with three amazing bonuses. Number one, crush pushers with analytics. Craig will show you data-driven strategies for beating a pusher in a way that allows you to play smart, aggressive tennis that limits your mistakes. Number two, big point strategy. When most players play a big point, they rely on their gut. Well, Craig relies on the data and shows you how to save break point, convert break point, win tiebreakers, and close out a lead. And number three, the practice court is broken. 
Craig uses this line to describe the fact that most players practice the old rules, the old strategies that are inferior. So in this bonus, Craig gives you a new practice plan that lets you practice the new rules, the new strategies that will win you the most points. So to check out the new rules of singles and all of its bonus content to improve your game, you can access them by downloading the Fuzzy Yellow Balls app from your phone's app store today. Links to both iOS and Android in the description.